Well, hello everybody. This is Andrew Bram. Welcome to this afternoon's session of Pavenars. Today we'll be talking about wide base tires, also known as super singles. If you look on the left side of the screen, you'll see a list of participants. And right under that list of participants are small icons, one of which is a hand. If you have a question during the Pavenar, please simply click on that icon and that will raise your electronic hand. And then on the bottom left side of the screen, you can type your question into the chat box. I will pause a convenient break and um, then answer the questions as they come along in the chat box. In addition, after the presentation, your professional development hours certificate will be emailed to you. So happy April Fool's Day. I briefly considered trying to make some sort of joke honoring the day, but then decided that as civil engineers, we should probably just stick with the, the technical information and go from there. So today we'll be talking about wide base tires. We'll first do a little bit of background, the importance of tires and pros and cons of the wide base tires, just kind of an overview of those topics. And then we're going to delve deeper into two different specific case studies. One was a case study at NCAT, the National Center for Asphalt Technology, where they actually performed an experiment on their test track looking at wide base tires versus the conventional dual tires. And they followed that up with doing the Wesley analysis, which is a pavement structure software analysis using uh, linear elastic layer theory to compare how that program was able to process the use of wide base tires. So trying to use a tool that we have at our disposal in pavement design and seeing what happens when you start changing the load shapes that are applied onto that. And then in Florida, they did some similar work. Instead of using a full scale test track, however, they used a heavy vehicle simulator, or HVS. And what this does is it stays in one place, and just a single tire goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you're able to get accelerated loading on a, a test section. They also uh, performed some finite element analysis, trying to determine how well they could predict um, pavement performance. So another tool, along with the Wesleya, is the finite element analysis that we can use. And then I thought we'd finish up with talking a little bit about fuel efficiency. Uh, during the pros of wide base tires discussion, we'll talk about how you can increase fuel efficiency. And there's a very nice study out of the Oak Ridge Laboratories that actually quantified that. So we'll go over some, um, some details on that as well. And also I got a, an email from the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, saying that they're currently in the middle of a pooled fund study looking at this topic. So if you're looking for some cutting edge work and research, um, the link on the webinar does not work, but I did just enter the link into the chat box. So you can click on that link if you're interested in figuring out what is currently going on in the FHWA pooled fund study. So the, the first question we can ask is why do we even have tires? Well, it's very important to transfer all of our loads from the vehicles that we're driving down into the pavement. And as the loads get larger and heavier, as is pictured in this semi, in the picture, um, that becomes even more critical. And the rubber and the air of the tires dampen any sort of rough surface you have. They make a super, uh, smoother ride. They protect the, the cargo that's within the trucks. But conversely, they also protect the pavement. Because if you have any sort of single loads that are applied at that um, at those weights, you would easily damage the pavement. So we're, we're trying to distribute these loads into the pavement and the pavement structure. Also of critical importance is the tread of the tires, because at the end of the day, safety is one of the key components we consider when designing pavements. And the tread of tires provides your friction between the tire and the pavement. Without this friction, any time you go around a curve, you just slide right off. So this tread and the the contact between the tire and the pavements provides this vital friction. So overall, really the interaction between the tires and your pavement is, is very critical. Traditionally, um, when you're driving down the highway, one of the things I love about my job is there's always things to look at. Whether you're looking at the pavement surface or you're looking at the vehicles around you, one of the, the things that I'm 
keenly interested in now is how many semis that are on the road are actually utilizing these wide base tires. So it's fun as you're driving along, as you're passing or being passed, to see what type of tire configuration these semis have. And traditionally, trucks utilize uh, four tires per axle. Um, so on the picture on the left there, those are an example of, of those dual tires. So there's two on the left side and two on the right side of the axle for four tires total. And in general, these have approximately nine inches of tread width. Obviously, it depends on your tire type and, and what you're doing. But um, the, the nine inches is around in that area. Wide base tires eliminate a tire from each side of the axle. So instead of having two on each side of the axle, you simply have one on each side of the axle. And <laughs> that tread width is incorrect. I, I apologize. It's the dangers of cutting and pasting. Um, but the tread width, as you can see in the very small picture, is approximately 15 inches in tread. So it's not quite double. You're not doubling the, the tire width and just sticking that on. It's actually a little smaller than that. So um, overall, you lose a little bit of tread width, but you go from two tires down to one tire. And there's several advantages to this new configuration. As you read through um, a lot of literature, you read through some nice websites that are out there, you're able to see that uh, wide base tires do decrease the fuel consumption. And depending on the study you're looking at, it's anywhere from three to over 9%. And you'll see uh, later on here in the fuel efficiency study that we review, um, they actually uh, got up to 10 and even 11%, depending on the load that was, a, or the, um, the weight of the cargo that was in the truck that was hauling. Another advantage is you have fewer tires to manage, so you're essentially cutting the number of tires on your trailer up by two. And this has uh, many benefits, including a weight reduction. You reduce the weight of your truck by about $100, or 100 pounds per wheel. And that's uh, 400 pounds of cargo that can then be carried that otherwise would have been prohibited. You can also increase your brake life. Because you have air on both sides of the tire, um, and there's more airflow on both sides of the tire, they don't heat up as much. So um, you have that higher air exposure, higher cooling, so you're able to increase your, your brake life. And then finally, ease of maintenance. I personally have never changed a semi-tire, but according to literature, that inside tire, if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, the inside tire is extremely, extremely difficult to maintain. Um, anywhere from changing it to even trying to fill, fill it with air, getting it to the right pressure, you have to reach around and, and work on a tire that you have essentially zero access to. So these are just some of the advantages that um, you have with wide base tires. Now, of course, there are some challenges as well. One of the big challenges, especially from our, our pavement design standpoint, is what is the effect on the pavement? Um, you have a, a smaller contact area, so you're going from about a 15 inch width. Um, uh, two dual tires have approximately 18 and a half inches or 17 and a half inches width, and a single wide base tire is about uh, 15 inches width. So you're decreasing the width of your overall tire. That means you're decreasing your contact area. You have the same loads that are coming down from the truck down into the pavement, so you're increasing the amount of stress, which is simply the load divided by the area that's being applied to the roadway. And this increases your surface stress and your surface strains. The higher the stresses are, the higher the strains or deformations are. And we can ask ourselves the question, what does that do to your load distribution that goes through the pavement structure? In my uh, introduction to transportation engineering class, I always emphasize how the whole point of roadways is to take these heavy loads that are a relatively small area and distribute them over a larger area. So as you're going down into the pavement structure, the load area is increasing, but the amount of load in each of that area is actually decreasing. So by the time you get down to the natural subgrade, the subgrade can actually hold the load that's being applied. So how is this load being distributed to the payment structure? That's a very interesting um, point that is important to know. Another uh, challenge is what areas of design need to be focused on? Do we need to question what type of materials we're putting into the pavement? Aggregate structures, aggregate size, those types of things? 
or um, the pavement structure. How thick are the layers? What type of layers do we have? What sort of tools are available to help? This, this presentation will go over two tools, the Wesleya and also some finite element simulation. So there are some tools out there, but how can we use those to actually effectively um, manage the use of wide-based tires? And then finally, how can we begin to quantify potential benefits? It's sometimes difficult to um, really look at these studies and, and see the, the added benefit. Maybe it's a small sample set. Maybe the uh, study was put out by the Wide Base Tire Association. So, of course, you're going to see increase of, of uh, efficiency. So how can we quantify these benefits? So these are the type of things that we're going to be talking about specifically in this presentation is, is the effects on pavements, areas of design, the tools available, and also quantifying the benefits. So that's just a brief background of wide-based tires, and now we're going to move on to NCAT's experience. If anyone has any questions, please click on the electronic hand, and you can type your question into the chat box. There's no questions at this point, so we'll move on to NCAT's experience. So NCAT stands for the National Center for Asphalt Technology. And what they did is they explored, explored the use of dual tires, which you can see on the left-hand side, and wide base tires, which you can see on the right-hand side, on the NCAT test track. If any of you guys have the opportunity to go down to Auburn, Alabama, I highly encourage you to get in touch with the uh, NCAT facility and take a tour of their test track. It's an absolutely gorgeous uh, setup with lots of, good, uh, lots of good stuff going on there. And uh, NCAT is known for this test track. One of the things that they do is they instrument the pavement. So as these trucks are going around in a circle, around and around they go, uh, the pavement is actually instrumented with strain gauges, pressure gauges, moisture gauges, and temperature gauges. So they're constantly collecting all of this information, which um, really adds value to understanding what's going on between the, the applied tire loads and the pavement surface. And you can download the report free off their website. I put the web link in the chat box. And it goes obviously into a lot more detail than what I'll be talking about. But we'll hit all the high points here today. So they compared a wide base single tire, which you can see on the left side of the picture there, with a set of standard dual tires, which you can see on the right side. Now for those of uh, you who aren't quite as familiar with tire naming systems, I was not aware of this, but there are three sets of numbers and one set of letters in every tire naming system. So if you use the numbering system AAA slash BBXCC.C, the AAA, the first three numbers, stand for the tire width, which is in millimeters. So you can see for this study, the standard dual tire was approximately 275 millimeters each in width whereas the wide base single was 445 millimeters in width. So overall, you're decreasing the width of your total tire contact area, but you're only using a single tire. The second number, the DB number, is the sidewall height as a percent of the tire width. And you can see here for the wide base tires, you have a much wider tire and probably a similar um, sidewall height. So you have 50% for your BB, whereas the standard dual has a narrower tire width um, and probably a similar sidewall height to the wide base tire, so you have a higher BB number, 80%. The, uh, so that takes care of the first two numbers, the AAA over BB. Then the letter you see in the middle there is the type of tire, and both these tires that were studies, studied were radial tires, or R. And then the last number, the CC point C, is simply the tire rim diameter, and that number is in inches. And both of these tires were 22.5 inches in diameter. Now the NCAT test tracks uh, consist of, I believe, I want to say off the top of my head, 22 test sections. Each test section is about 500 feet long. If someone's on here from NCAT, please feel free to uh, correct me if it's more than 22, but I believe it's 22 sections. Each section is 500 feet long, and they specifically focused on this test section, which had about six and three quarters inches of hot mix asphalt placed over six inches of granular base 
which is on 17 inches of compacted subgrade, which is all sitting on the existing subgrade soil. And I had mentioned that they heavily instrumented this pavement layer, so they put strain gauges, and that can measure the um, tensile strains at the bottom of the HMA layer. At the top of the granular base, they placed a stress gauge, so you are able to measure the uh, pressure that's being applied at the top of the granular base layer. And then they also measured the stress at the top of the subgrade by placing a gauge at the top of the subgrade layer. So um, a couple slides ago, I was talking about how the whole point of a pavement structure is to take a load that's on the very top of the hot mix asphalt and distribute that wider and wider. So you're increasing the area that's being impacted, but you're decreasing the actual load that's being applied. And they're measuring how this load is being decreased as you go down through the pavement layers by placing these um, stress gauges at the top of the two, at the top of the base layer and the top of the compacted subgrade. And you can see here they um, have horizontal micro strain. So this is that tensile strain that's at the bottom of the HMA layer. And um, you can see here you have both the average response and the maximum response, the standard dual and the wide base single measured on both those. And with all of this, there's no significant difference at a 95% confidence level. So um, with 95% confidence, uh, MCAT can say that there is no difference between the standard dual and the wide base single tires for the strain at the bottom of the pavement. So if you're thinking about fatigue cracking, which often forms by those strains occurring at the bottom of that asphalt layer, they didn't see any differences using these two different types of tires. This is the base stress, so that um, stress meter that they put on the top of the granular base. Again, there was no significant difference between either the average response or the maximum response between the standard dual and the wide base single. And then the same with the subgrade. There is no significant difference between the standard dual and the wide base single. Now I'd like to just point out here, the reason they took the average response versus the maximum response is that you have these trucks driving down the road and you have the pavement instrumented only in certain places. And if uh, the truck goes you know, a couple inches to the left, a couple inches to the right of the gauge, you're going to get a slightly different number. Now, if you read the report, you'll see that they did mark up the pavement and the truckers aimed to go over certain uh, points of the pavement. But um, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get a little bored driving on the interstate, I like try and see how close I can get to the rumble strips or something, you know, just kind of something to keep you awake. And it's very difficult to stay on a, a very extremely straight line while you're driving. So there is a little bit of wander or deviation in the path of the truck. So. Um, after several of these um, loops around the track, they have an average response and they also have the maximum response. And NCAP believes that the maximum response is actually the most accurate response because that implies that the truck went directly over the gauge. But they did want to provide the average and the maximum just to, to kind of give a full picture of what was going on in the pavement structure. So along with those um, average and maximum results from the, the strain gauges at the bottom of the HMA layer and the pressure gauges at the top of the granular base and the compacted subgrade courses, they also looked over um, looked at some dynamic strain trace data. And this is actually an image of how the, the truck went over an individual point. So you can see that as a truck moves over a pavement section, um, you have the influence of the very front axle going over the pavement section. And um, you'll see that those are the, when you're thinking about a semi-truck, those are the single tires on the very front of the truck. And then on the cab, but below the trailer, those is what I call the mid tires. And then at the very back of the truck, you have the rear tires. So for the NCAT test track, they only looked at the rear tires by replacing standard dual tires and wide base single tires. So in theory, the front and the mid dynamic strain trace should be similar here, whereas the rear was the one 
is the area where they actually had the two different sections. Um, a couple things that they saw from this, one is that there is actually a small amount of compression that precedes the tension. So as a wheel is going over the pavement, at the bottom of that asphalt layer, just before the wheel goes over the pavement, there's actually a little bit of compression going on. And then as the wheel is going over, there's the tension. It's getting pulled apart. And that's repeated as the truck goes over. And you can see all five of the axles going over that point. So this is just kind of a nice little graph to see what's actually happening throughout the entire uh, loading of the pavement. And you can see again where the um, maximum and average values can come from this as, as there's small differences as you go along. So those were the results from the uh, test section. The instrumentation within the test section, just seeing what would physically happen as trucks go around. They also did a Wesleya pavement analysis, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, but this is a linear elastic analysis of pavement layers. And what they did is they um, <clears throat> looked at the same pavement cross-section within this analysis. They weighed the semis in order to understand what kind of weight is being applied. Then they applied a mid-tandem mid group and a rear tandem group. So they're able to, one of the nice things about these um, computer programs is that you're able to um, look at different uh, different configurations. So in the test track, they only changed the rear tandem. Here in this pavement analysis using the software, they did both the mid tandem and also the rear tandem. And you can see as you change the tires, you go from in the mid tandem group, approximately 4,700 pounds for a single tire, up to about 9,300 pounds for the, um, the wide base tire. You also increase the pressure. Uh, the inflation pressure of the tire itself goes from about 100 to 120. And in the rear, there's a little less weight back there. In the rear tandem group, the dual is about 3,900 pounds for a single tire. And the wide base is about 7,800 pounds. And you can see the inflation is the same as the mid tandem group. Um, another thing is a lot of these computer programs, they have a limited amount of um, layers that you can put into them. So I just wanted to point out that they had to combine the base and the compacted subgrade into a single layer in order to perform the analysis. And what you can do with this is you can actually predict your payment response. So here are some of those predictions. Um, you have on the, um, on the y-axis on the left side, you have your micro strain, which is those tensile strains at the bottom of the asphalt layer. And then on the right side, you have your vertical stresses. So that's what sort of stresses you're expecting to see in your layers. And you can look at the theoretical versus measured values for the standard dual configuration. So this is looking at just the dual tires, looking at how the strains and the stresses in the pavement compare from actual field measurements to a computer program. And they said that the linear layered elastic theory was reasonably accurate in predicting the pavement response. Now this is for the standard dual configuration. As you move over on the next slide to the wide-based single configuration, they uh, noted that the computer program provided a decent prediction, but it was not as close as the standard dual configuration. So you can see that strain is a little wider, and that subgrade stress is also a little bit wider. So although it's relatively close, it wasn't quite as accurate. And they felt that um, one of the reasons that this happened is that Wesley assumes a circle contact area. So if you can imagine taking a tire and pushing it into the ground, there's going to be some sort of footprint in the ground. And you'll see in a later uh, presentation, it's, it's not a rectangle, and it's not a circle either. It's more of kind of like an oval type shape. Wesley assumes a circle contact area, and having one bigger circle versus two smaller circles, they feel that um, it gives you slightly less accurate results. So the, the take home in my mind from this is that there's, there's a lot of tools out there to analyze payment responses, even to analyze materials. And you always have to be careful with what sort of assumptions are made when using these tools in order to ensure that you're getting the response that you're expecting and you're getting an accurate response. So some of the conclusions that NCAT came up 
with is that the Wesley does not predict the response with wide base tires as well as dual tires. We just were talking about that circular load assumption. They did feel, however, that in the field, the horizontal strain, the base stress, and the subgrade stress were statistically equal. And this is good news from a pavement design standpoint. Um, as trucks uh, start going over more to these wide base tires, and every time I go on a trip, there seems to be a couple more wide base tires than the last time I went. Um, that's important to know as pavement designers, is how are these new pieces of equipment influencing our uh, pavement performance. They did, however, recommend uh, further research. They thought that a lot more work needed to be done with measuring the actual tire footprints. So what kind of print is actually being applied to the pavement, and how is that done? And then also they recommended looking at the shear stresses under the tire loads. And that's a very nice segue into the next section, um, because Florida does a lot of work with shear stresses, so we'll get into more of that. And a report that, unfortunately, I didn't have time to cover in this presentation, looking at tire footprints, if you Google uh, University of Illinois and wide base tires, you'd be able to find some reports that they've done where they're actually looking a lot more at that tire footprint. So lots of good work going on uh, beyond this. So, so far we've covered a little bit of background of, of standard tires and wide base tires. And uh, we went over NCAT's experience, and now we're going to cover Florida's experience. But if there are any questions, um, please raise your electronic hand and type your question in the chat box. So moving on to Florida's experience, uh, Florida also looked at um, several different types of wide base tires. You can see here they explored one dual tire set, which is on the right-hand side, and then three sets of wide base tires. And uh, they looked at um, an NGWB 445 and a 455. That 455 is 10 millimeters wider than the 445. And then they also looked at a traditional super single. So um, wide base tires are actually not tremendously new in the in the trucking industry, they've been around for about um, 30 years now. But in the 80s, in that first decade, they um, the the tires did quite a bit of damage to pavements. And this is my informal belief, but I think that they were designing the super single tires as essentially just like one bigger dual tire. But when doing that, they actually added a lot of um, complications to the the tires' performance and the pavements' performance. And now with this next generation, NG wide base tires, NGWB, um, they've addressed a lot of those and they've come out with much better designs that are much more gentle on the pavement and still give you all the benefits of the traditional super single. So you'll see during this project um, how they use the, uh, they compared the super single to these next generation wide base and you can get a lot of, of good information about comparing those different generations. And they looked at two different things. They looked at pavement rutting, and they also looked at surface strains in the field portion. And then, in addition, they did look at some um, final elements of simulations as well. And you won't be able to click on that link, but I will cut and paste the link. And uh, you can click on that link in the chat box and go from there. So we do have a, a question. I'll take a question at this time from Steve. And he said, um, did the NCAT study use higher tire pressures for the wide base tires than the standard tires? And he said that he would have thought that the 120 PSI versus the 100 PSI would have an impact on the stresses and strains. And Steve, that's an excellent question, because the, the uh, pressure of the tire does have a huge impact on its performance. And with the NCAT study, they looked at the um, tensile strains at the bottom of the pavement and then the stresses down at the uh, base and the sub-base layers. And those three areas, they didn't see any differences. Now, when you start looking at shear stresses, that's when you start to see some of those uh, differences. So this is an excellent segue into Florida's work because they did look at those shear stresses. And I think that um, you'll see some of the interesting information, the shear stresses and also the writing, in fact. And some of those may have more um, more influence than um, the, the pressure versus the actual size. So excellent question, Stephen. 
I think we'll see how that kind of plays out here in Florida as well. So in Florida, uh, not only did they look at three different uh, tire types, three different wide base tires and a dual tire, but they also looked at two pavement structures. They have a lot of open grade surface courses down in Florida. There's a lot of rain in Florida, so they want that open grade to get the rain down off the surface and out to the sides of the uh, pavement layer. And you can see the uh, pavement structure there. And then they also had a dense graded surface uh, mix. So you're looking at both open graded and dense graded. And you'll notice in the surface courses, they also use 12% asphalt rubber um, within the mix. So I assume they mean that they um, substituted 12% of the binder with rubber, because that can't be a 12% binder content. Um, and then uh, the, the dense grade had 5% rubber. So they not only put some rubber in, but they also had these different types of um, pavement structures and surfaces. And then they used a, a heavy vehicle simulation, simulator, or an HVS. And I was pretty disappointed. I actually had an opportunity to go down and tour Florida's labs about a year ago. And I couldn't find my pictures. I know they're somewhere on my computer, but I couldn't find them. So I had to just take a picture off of um, Pavement Interactive, which is a great website. But um, I had to take their picture of a heavy vehicle simulator. But you can see under that heavy vehicle simulator, there is a single tire. And that tire just goes back and forth back and forth. And it's unidirectional, unidirectional, which means that the load is applied in one direction. The tire is actually lifted, brought back to the original place, placed down again, and it's applied again. Um, so it's just all being applied in one direction, which is more representative of what actually happens in the field. Uh, they also introduced five inches of wheel wander. That means that after a certain amount of cycles, they can actually shift it left or right about five inches. And that really represents more accurately what's happening in the field. Uh, trucks don't go along a straight line down the pavement. So when you're doing these um, uh, simulations here in a controlled setting, you don't want to have those tires just going in the same place. You want it to move around a little bit. And they applied a 9,000 pound load at a speed of eight miles per hour. And they were able to, for the rutting, control the temperature at 122 degrees Fahrenheit, so kind of force it to be under very extreme conditions that uh, generally promotes rutting. And the test ran until 0.5 inches, or 12 and a half millimeters, of rutting was observed. So that's all for the rutting. Then they also did some studies looking at um, the strains, the shear strains being applied five inches from the tire edge. And those were run at ambient temperatures. So the, the field study was kind of split into two parts here. So for the first one, this is the rutting data. You can see for the open graded surface course, they just ran that machine pass after pass after pass up to approximately 50,000 for some of the mixes, just looking to see how long does it take to get that half inch or 12 and a half millimeters rutting. You can see the traditional super single, the uh, models that were introduced about 30 years ago that had the worst performance. Um, the next two, the next generation wide base tires, had slightly better performance. And the wider the tire, uh, the better the rutting performance to the point where that um, 455 millimeter width tire had pretty similar performance to the dual tires. So overall, they felt that the newer generation wide base tires performed better than the super single. But at the end of the day, the dual tires still performed the best. And uh, Steve, we could uh, dig into the tire pressures here. And I can try and do that on the fly while I do a little bit of filler talk. But um, this may be a, a better indication of um, what kind of um, pressures are in there and how that could affect it. And in this study, and this is not on the, the, the chart, but in this study, all tires, except for the super single, were inflated to 100 PSI. So the dual tires, the NGWBs, those three tires were all at 100 PSI. And the super single, the green line, was 115 PSI. So between those NGWBs and the dual tires, there was no difference in the pressure. 
but the super single had a higher pressure, 15 psi higher. And you can see here for the dense graded surface rutting, um, the first one we looked at was the OGFC. The second one here is the dense graded. And you have a very similar ranking. Uh, the super single performs the worst. The two next generation wide base tires are better. And the thicker is better than the thinner. And then the dual tire performs the best. So you have a very similar ranking. But it's much better performing than the open graded course. So if you look here at the dense graded surface riding, your scale goes from 0 to 150,000 passes. And if we go back one slide, the scale goes from 0 to 80,000 passes. So you're almost doubling, maybe even tripling your life by using the dense graded surface for rutting. Now you can see here, they also looked at um, the strains in the pavement. Now this is the shear strains on the pavement. This is where they ran the tire next to a foil strain gauge that was approximately five inches offset from the tire. And but you can see very similar um, results to what happened at NCAT. There's a small wave of what they call compression immediately before the tire goes over. And then there's a peak of tension. And then it kind of goes back to normal. So um, as the wheel is approaching, which is happening in about six and a half seconds, there's a little bit of compression as the wheel goes over between six and a half and seven seconds. You get the large amount of tension, which decreases uh, into noise. And you can hear, see here the uh, surface strain measurements. So this is looking at what sort of uh, shear stresses are occurring. And shear stresses are something that is a big concern with what's called top-down cracking. If you have high shear stresses at the surface of the layer, that can promote cracking that begins at the surface of the layer and moves down. And that's an opposite to traditional fatigue cracking, which starts at the bottom of the pavement and moves up. You can see here the um, uh, two different speeds. You have two miles per hour and eight miles per hour. The super single and the dual actually perform the worst, whereas those next generation wide bases have pretty uh, significantly lower tensile micro strain. So they're seeing some added benefits here to actually using the, the wide body tires over the super singles and the uh, dual tires. And if you recall, this is all done at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't heated up like the rutting work was done. Now here, they, um, uh, so that's the, the field work that they did with the heavy vehicle simulator, looking at the running, rutting and the shear stresses. And then they did a little bit of finite element analysis. NCAT, they did some Wesley, which is a layered elastic pavement analysis. Finite element analysis is another computer program that you can use in order to try and simulate and predict what is going to happen in the field of pavements. And if you recall from the NCAT computer analysis, they assumed circular loadings. But when you actually look at the uh, print of both dual tires and the wide bodies, they're not circular. It's, um, you could call it a football shape. The, especially the wide base over there kind of looks like a football but without the edges, but it's certainly not a circle. Another thing that's very important is the treads. And you can see here they actually varied the length of the treads and also the pressure that's being applied on each tread. So the, um, um, the dual tires were inflated to 100 psi, but when you look at the inside of a tire, there's actually slightly higher pressures being applied for the dual tires. And for the wide, uh, wide base tires, you actually have a little less than the 100 on the very edges. But again, you have higher stresses or pressures in the middle. So lots of interesting things going on here in the finite element analysis, not only looking at shapes, but also looking at pressures on the treads. And what they looked at was the uh, vertical strain, which is the rutting. They looked at surface strain, which can be surface strain and um, strain shear, which can be associated with top-down cracking. And they also looked at um, tensile strains at the bottom of the asphalt layer, which is bottom-up fatigue cracking. So this is a, a very nice example of the benefits of using computer programs to help, because they were able to compare field data to computer data 
with the rutting and the surface strains. And if those match well, then they could uh, with confidence to say this is what's happening at the bottom of the layer. Although they didn't instrument it, they calibrated their computer model with two instrumented measurements and then they're looking at different points in the pavement structure to try and get an understanding of what's going on. So one nice thing about these uh, finite element analysis uh, programs is they get really pretty pictures and you can see the dual transverse uh, tires on the top and then the um, wide base tires on the uh, bottom. And they have both transverse stresses and longitudinal stresses. And when you're looking at this at the end of the day, red is undesirable. So as the more red comes to the surface, that means that the stresses and strains are higher, which indicates more uh, potential damage to the pavement. And they took this uh, computer software and then did a little bit more of analysis, which is covered in more detail in the report. Um, but in terms of rutting, the conclusions of Florida was that the newer generation wide base tires do perform better than the um, original super singles, but they perform slightly worse than the dual tires. They also found that the open graded surface courses are more rut prone than the dense graded surface courses. They found that the newer generation wide base tires perform better for top down cracking. And they found that the maximum surface strain occurs about 9 to 10 inches from the edge of the tires and about 2 inches from the surface. So lots more details in the report, but these are kind of the biggest take homes that I found. And I think it's very interesting about that last point. It's because those of us who um, are very familiar with paving of asphalt roads, there's usually a um, interface two inches from the surface. And that interface is where these maximum strains are occurring. So when you're thinking about pavement design and when you're thinking about tires influence on pavement structures, we may be setting ourselves up for failure at the very beginning by having that top lift thickness of about two inches because that means that you're going to have maximum strains right at the interaction of a pavement. But that's kind of for another whole uh, discussion. I just thought that was pretty interesting and uh, worthwhile to point out. So that's uh, Florida's experiences. And the last thing we'll finish up with is a little uh, look into the fuel analysis. But if there's any questions, I'll, I'll take those now. Simply raise your electronic hand, click on that, and then type a question in the chat box. Well, it's not a question, but uh, Steve gave some excitement, basically saying that, uh, saying traditionally those original super singles kind of gave this concept a bad name. Um, so original super singles kind of beat the pavement up. Now that we have this next generation wide base tires, uh, those seem to be acting a little bit of difference. So thanks, Steve, for that feedback. So moving on to the, the fuel study, as I mentioned, this is um, from a study at Oak, Bridge, Oak, Oak Ridge National Laboratory over in Tennessee. And uh, the full citation is down there. I didn't want to put this in writing, but if you Google that title, which I'll put into the uh, chat box, they actually have a preprint of this article available online. So um, I'm not by any means promoting the uh, illegal use of downloading, but um, it is something that they have posted online. So if you, if you Google that title, you will be able to find this, this article. And what they did is they measured the fuel efficiency for long haul class 8 trucks in the US. They defined long haul as greater than 300 miles from the garage area. So these are trucks that spend a lot of time in the open road just moving from point A to point B, not um, just you know bouncing around from a Walmart distribution center to a Walmart five miles away. So this can really kind of give a, a large range of, of fuel data. And class 8 trucks are those trucks that are greatest. <laughs> they're not greater than 330,000 pounds. They're greater than 33,000 pounds. And this is the highest class of trucks. And this includes the semi-trucks.
And what they did is they quantified two different things. They quantified the fuel efficiency, and they also looked at the fuel efficiency as a function of load level. So in this presentation, there's a lot of good material in there. I'm not going to be able to cover the load level, but they did load trucks at a what they call a light, a medium, and a heavy loading, and looked at the fuel efficiency specifically in terms of loading. But um, I'm just going to go over uh, a general idea of the fuel efficiency of wide base tires. So what they did is they took six Class 8 trucks, and they um, took data for one year, taking five readings a second. So there's a tremendous amount of data that was collected on this. And they collected data for the fuel rate, how much fuel they were burning, engine speed, gear ratio, vehicle speed, all sorts of weather information, including wind speed, precipitation, and air temperature. They looked at spatial information, latitude, longitude, and altitude from our GPS that was hooked on there, and also instantaneous tractor and trailer weight. Lots and lots of information here that they tried to pull together and get an idea of what was going on in the field. They took half the tractors, which is the uh, cab portion, and half the trailers. Half of them had wide base tires and half had regular tires. All in all, these six trucks traveled 688,000 miles, and they burned 103,000 gallons of fuel. They took 1,100 trips. They visited 37 states, and they visited one Canadian province. Lots of good work here that was done in order to really capture what was going on with the use of wide base tires. They did have four categories established. They had the tractor with duels and the trailer with duels. So if you're looking at the side of a semi-truck, uh, you have your front single axle with one wheel on each side. Then in the middle, you have your tractor duels. And then in the very end, you have your trailer duels. And then they did all the different permutations. They use a tractor with duels and the trailer with the wide base. They use tractor with wide base, trailer with duels. And they use both the tractor and the trailer with the, the wide base. And you can see down there the, the six trucks that they used were a mix of manual transmission and auto transmission. Um, they did include idling time in this study. They have information about your distance traveled and um, also the total time which the data was collected, the average speed that the truck was moving, the average moving speed, which does not include idle time, the total amount of fuel consumed, and then the overall fuel efficiency. So you can see, in general, uh, semi-trailers get around 6 to 7 miles per gallon, which was much lower than um, I thought it was. Uh, it's certainly a lot worse than the Honda Fit that my wife and I drive. But um, that just kind of shows how a little bit of fuel savings can go a long way. And they mentioned that in their um, review is they had to be very meticulous with this because small changes could lead to relatively big differences in, in fuel burn. And this is the, um, the nice summary slide here. You can see that they had dual, dual, dual wide body, wide body, dual, and then both wide body. And you can just see the increase in and gain of efficiency as you go through each step. You go from 6.6 .6 miles per gallon all the way up to 7.22. Um, you can see, though, that those fall within the standard deviations of the data collected, so there's some overlap. But um, the, the sample size is large, so they really did a pretty good job of, of getting quite a bit of replicates in this. And they, um, I, I mentioned before that I wasn't going to break it down into the light, medium, and heavy categories, but the, the trends were, this is a summary of those three combined, and they broke them down into light, medium, and heavy. As the loads got lighter, the fuel efficiency went up, but the trends were similar. And they found that um, you get approximately a 6% fuel efficiency if half of your truck is equipped with wide base tires, and then you get a 9% fuel efficiency when it's all, when the entire trick, truck is, is equipped with wide base tires. So this is just one study. The, the paper actually won an award at the Transportation Research Board. It won the Pike Johnson Award, which is the Outstanding Paper in Planning and Environment. So very nice study, very well written, very comprehensive data set, um, which I think can really add some light on to the fuel efficiency. So with that being said, in summary, um, I'm going to wrap up the logistics, and then I'll open the floor to questions. But the, Professional development hours will be emailed to you after the presentation. 
You'll get them no later than this Friday, April 4th. You can rewatch the, any of these paid webinars through the website. And uh, once you get the professional development hours, you'll know that the presentation and recording has been uploaded online. The next paid webinar will be Tuesday, May 6th. It will cover Portland cement concrete overlays. And I do want to point out that this will be the last paid webinar, not only for the season, but um, for this series. I, I started this out about four years ago, and I've learned a tremendous amount. I've learned that it's impossible to predict how other people's computers will work. But um, you know, as I've been here at the University of Arkansas a little longer, um, I have accumulated other tasks. And while I've enjoyed this tremendously, um, I've determined that something's had to give. And, and this is one of those things that I will be uh, bypassing. But I've, I've enjoyed it tremendously, and I appreciate all of your participations. But uh, next Tuesday, May 6th, will be the last paving hour I'll do. So at this point, um, I'll open it up for questions. We provide a little bit of background. We looked at some case studies from NCAT in Florida, and then we also looked at some fuel burn. But if you have any questions, please raise your electronic hand, type them in the chat box, and I'll be happy to hang around as, as long as there are questions. So the first question from uh, Brian is, did the Florida report show a change in relative performance between the tires when the speed was increased from 2 to 8 miles per hour? And should it be expected that the results of these comparison studies will change as speed or loading is varied? And yes, Brian, that's a very good question. Um, if we uh, hop back to uh, slide 28, um, surface boom. Right here, you do see some noticeable differences between the 2 miles per hour and 8 miles per hour. It's intuitive that as loads are going over more slowly, there'll be more uh, micro strain on the bottom. So there definitely was a difference between 2 and 8 miles an hour. And this is one of the disadvantages of these heavy vehicle simulators. You, you can't have a wheel flying down this little 50-foot section at you know 55 miles an hour. So it is a slower loading. They're designed to put the pavement under increased stresses so you have failures earlier to shorten the testing time. So yes, there are differences between the speeds, um, and there's differences in, in potential damages between the speed. Now Auburn, I believe Auburn uh, ran their test at, I want to say 45 miles an hour was the truck speed going over. So again, a little higher, but certainly not at interstate speeds, which get up to 70 miles per hour. So I do definitely think that speed has a huge influence, and I definitely think that loading would have a huge influence. And all we can do, um, NCAT and, and Florida are both leaders in, in field simulations and field experimentations. All we can do is kind of do our best and use the tools that we have and try and extrapolate findings from that. So. Um, yes, loads and speeds do make a difference, and what we're seeing here are general trends and general indications based on uh, information that's available and tools that are available to us. But thank you for the um, uh, Pavinar, and uh, or thank you for the question and uh, a comment from Julius Shaw, saying that well, first of all, this isn't the last Pavinar. The last Pavinar will be on May fourth. Oh boy, I already forgot that date. The last paving hour will be on May 6th. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. But, but thank you for the, the feedback. And uh, also from Steve, he's uh, sorry to hear that the next paving hour is the last. But uh, thank you very much for that, that positive feedback. Um, so. Oh, and another uh, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. If there are any more technical questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I certainly appreciate the, the, the feedback. But if there's any more technical questions, I will hang around. And if not, uh, thank you very much for joining me. And I will see you a month from now.